Well, as always, church, it is so good to be with you. Uh, for those who may not know me, my name is Tyler David. I'm the downtown campus pastor and one of the preaching pastors here at the Austin Stone. Uh, today, we're continuing on in our study of the Gospel of Mark, but we're starting a new seven-week series. We're starting a new seven-week series called Normal Christianity. And we're not leaving the Gospel of Mark. We're going to stay in the Gospel of Mark. But the reason for this series is it captures a larger theme that's going on in the Gospel of Mark over the next two chapters. See, this Gospel of Mark is broken up into two main acts, two main stories that are being told. See, during the first eight chapters, Mark is trying to communicate to his audience that Jesus is the King. He's the Christ. That he's the King. He's a long-awaited Messiah of the people of God. And so he tells story after story of power and healing and teaching and authority to show his audience, to show us that Jesus is the Christ. But at the Mount of Transfiguration, something happens. At the Mount of Transfiguration, something happens, and Mark begins to shift in his narrative, in his gospel, to tell us that this king must die. In the, last, in the past two weeks, Matt did a perfect job of capturing this, that the transfiguration was the contrast of Jesus revealing his glory and telling his disciples that he's going to die. And that's the next part of this gospel, that this king must die. But before Jesus gets to Jerusalem, before he gets to the cross, Mark spends two chapters in 9 through 11 showing us that Jesus was training and teaching and developing his disciples to, to show them what it meant to follow him. He's getting them ready to advance the kingdom of God after he finishes the work that the Father gave him to do. See, these young men, these disciples would be the ones to teach the world what it meant to know, love, and obey, and follow Jesus. They will be the disciple, the disciple makers of all nations. So he's teaching them, he's training them, getting them ready to advance the kingdom when he's gone. So the next seven weeks we'll be studying things like ambition, and relationships, and marriage, and divorce, and finances. Because Jesus thinks it's necessary for them to understand these things in order to make disciples of all nations. And all the while, all the while, reminding them that he is going to die. So we entitled this series, Normal Christianity, because this section of scripture describes what should be normal for followers of Jesus. This series is not for radical followers of Jesus, but for every follower of Jesus. Now, no doubt, these standards and values and practices that Jesus puts um, into action for his young men will appear radical to our society and to our culture, but they should not appear radical to the church. For the next seven weeks is Jesus teaching us what normal Christianity looks like. So our first text is Mark 9, 14 through 29. So if you have a Bible, go and open up there. Mark 9, 14 through 29. And this text is immediately after the Mount of Transfiguration. See, Jesus just revealed his glory to the disciples, showed them who he was, that he's God in the flesh. But right after that, they walk down the mountain to find that the world is still broken that the world still has evil in it, and we are not home yet. So we'll look at Mark 9, 14 through verse 29. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen behind me. Verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, and ran up to, me, uh, up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? 
And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. The first lesson that Jesus has for us in this series, that he has for us today, is simply this. Weak faith in Jesus is stronger than the greatest faith in ourselves. That weak faith in Jesus is stronger than the greatest faith in ourselves. See, faith is only as strong as the object you're trusting in. Faith is only as strong as the thing that you're trusting. See, we can have all sorts of self-assurance and confidence and faith in our own abilities, our own wisdom, our own strength, but it's only a matter of time before the evil in this world shows us just how powerless we are. That great faith in a weak Savior means nothing. Great faith in a weak Savior means nothing. And often the powerless Savior, the weak Savior you and I trust is ourselves. We trust ourselves. And my life, my life is littered with stories of me putting strong faith in a very weak Savior, namely myself. It's a story of my life. Um, Unfortunately, and and I'm being honest, unfortunately, um, I have never had a shortage of faith in myself. Okay, I've, all, I've never been one to lack confidence, and I've never been one to uh, not be self-assured. I mean, I am like, I'm a firstborn child, so like most firstborn people in here, I'm irrationally self-assured of myself. I am. Even when it's unwarranted, I'm confident when I shouldn't be. And so often, I have this great faith in myself, but often it doesn't produce what it promised. So a great story that illustrates this, captures this perfectly, is when I was 10 years old, about 11 years old. And there's a girl across the street who I thought was pretty cute. Okay, so I try to go to my way and impress her from time to time. There's one day in particular where I was riding my bike, riding my huffy, looking awesome, and <laughs> obviously, and I see her in the front yard. So I'm thinking, okay, this is my time to shine, so I think, what should I do? And I'm riding, I go, I'm going to give her the cool guy head nod. And so I'm riding, I give her the head nod, thinking, got this, nailed it, and as soon as I did it, I run into a parked car. As soon as it happened. I go flying under the hood, and I'm embarrassed, I'm terrified, I scramble off the hood, I get on my bike, I don't make eye contact, and I just ride away and I go home. And I, then I did what every young, respectable man would do, I never talked to her ever again. It's like, you're dead to me. Um, but in that situation, the problem wasn't my faith. I had plenty of faith. I had plenty of assurance in myself. No, it was that the object of my faith was lacking. The object of my faith was lacking. I'd put strong faith in a weak savior, one that wasn't strong enough to save, one that didn't have peripheral vision to see the car right in front of me. I had great faith, but I had put it in a weak savior. And this is exactly what the disciples had, great faith in their own abilities. And they will find out, just like we find out in our lives, that we make very weak saviors. See, Jesus and three disciples come down the mountain to find the disciples arguing with some scribes. And Jesus asks the question, what's going on? What are you guys arguing about? And a weary father steps forward. He says that he has a son that he brought to him, a son who had been suffering from very, very violent seizures. And we know from the text that these seizures in particular is not just a medical issue. It's a demonic issue. There's an unclean spirit that's causing this little boy to have violent seizures. And so the father, like any good dad, comes to Jesus because he wants his son healed. He wants his son to be fixed, finally. And he brings, and he comes to to where Jesus was, but he's on the mountain, so he tries to get the disciples to heal him, and they can't. They fail. And what Jesus would do, he would eventually heal the boy, and we'll get to that later on. But the first thing I want to see is the the lesson he had for the disciples. And after he heals the, the little boy, he goes to the disciples and teaches them about their great faith in themselves and how powerless They are. Look at verses 28 and 29. Jesus says this, And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. See, after everything was over, Jesus comes into the house, and immediately the disciples ask him, Why couldn't we cast it out? They're perplexed. They're probably frustrated. They're probably a little humiliated in front of the crowd where they couldn't do what they promised they could do. But the reason they're so perplexed is because they've done this before. In Mark 6, 7 through 13, Mark tells us that Jesus gave authority to the disciples to cast out demons. In Mark 6, 13, he, it says they cast out many demons. They had done this before. It wasn't anything new for these disciples. They had done this. 
But for some reason, this time in particular, something was different. They couldn't cast out this demonic spirit, and they didn't understand why. So they asked him, why not? And his answer reveals just how much faith they had in themselves. See, Jesus tells them that only prayer can drive out this type of demon. Only prayer can. His answer reveals how self-reliant they actually were. See, Jesus did not say, well, it's longer prayers or godlier prayers or more passionate prayers or more theologically precise prayers. He didn't say that. He just says, you just have to pray. And the indictment is very clear. They hadn't prayed at all. They hadn't prayed at all. Jesus says, all you have to do is pray, and they didn't pray at all. It wasn't that their prayers weren't strong enough, it's that they weren't existent. See, they saw a situation they had normally come across and they thought they could handle it on their own. See, they had faith in themselves. That's evidenced by their lack of prayer. See, lack of prayer always demonstrates is evidence of lack of faith in Jesus and strong faith in ourselves. Lack of prayer in my life shows that I lack faith in Jesus, but I have a lot of faith in myself. This is why Jesus called them faithless in verse 19. In verse 19, when he comes down and he says, and he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. The disciples didn't pray because they thought they could handle it. They lost sight of their utter dependence upon God. See, they thought the power belonged to them, not to God. And this is why we don't pray. You and I don't pray because at the end of the day, we think we can handle most situations. We presume upon his grace and think, well, the reason I have a good marriage is because I've been a really good spouse. Or the reason there's reconciliation in my relationships is because I've been really wise. The reason I have a good job or whatever it is, because I've been doing good. Until a situation arises that your normal means of operation can't fix. Where the normal mode of what you've normally done, you can't overcome this evil and you begin to realize how dependent upon God you had been all along, you had just forgot. The situation shows them, their lack of prayer shows them their lack of faith. See, no matter how much faith you think you have or I think I have, prayer, like nothing else, shows how much faith is actually there. You may think, I have all kinds of faith, but if you don't pray, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. That's why Jesus calls them faithless, because they hadn't prayed. See, he's showing them that their lack of prayer showed lack of faith in him, but great faith in themselves. And the scene is obvious to them that they are very powerless saviors. Jesus is teaching his young men, you're not powerful enough to overcome this type of evil. He's showing them that, but he doesn't, he's not just stopping there. He's not just critiquing them, but he also is giving them a picture of what faith looks like. He's showing them a picture through this father that even weak faith in Jesus has an unbelievable power. That even weak faith in Jesus has an unbelievable power. See, this whole episode started because this father brought his son to be healed by Jesus. And the way the father interacts with Jesus is a great picture of what faith for us often looks like. So Jesus finally comes off the mountain and he finds this crowd arguing and finally he asks for the boy to be brought to him. And when the boy gets in front of him, he has another seizure. A violent, terrible seizure. And then Jesus begins to speak. Verse 21. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. So we find out that these fits, these seizures have been happening to this little boy since he was small, often almost killing him. And then the father expresses something that all of us can relate with. He uses this phrase that says, surely Jesus, if you can, if you can. See, he's already been let down by the disciples. He brought his son to be healed, to be fixed finally from all the evil he was suffering. It got to the disciples, and they weren't able to do it. So I'm sure he's thinking, I wonder if Jesus is going to fare any better, any better with my son. And all of us have done what the Father has done. All of us have hedged our bets when we've prayed. 
We all hedge our bets when we pray. See, often we don't go boldly before God and ask him for what we want, give him our needs and ask him to meet them. No, often we use small little caveats in our prayers to protect us from being let down. We'll say things like, we'll express our need and desire, and we'll say things like, well, God, if it's your will. Or God, you just do what you think is best. And can I tell you, those are true things. Those are appropriate things to pray often. But I wonder how often we use those spiritual phrases to protect us. Because we've prayed before and nothing has seemed to happen. We've asked God before and nothing seemed to happen. So we give caveats to say, well, he probably won't do it anyway. We begin to lower our expectations of what God could actually do. And Jesus hears this statement, and he hears our statements where we kind of hedge our bets, and he calls out the lack of faith. Look at verse 23 again. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. See, Jesus responds incredulously. He says, if I can, you think the problem's in me? No, Jesus says, no, the problem's not in my ability to heal. The problem's in your ability to believe. He doesn't mince words. He tells him exactly what his issue is. See, there's nothing impossible for the one who believes because nothing is impossible for God. And this say, the statement of if you can is just the Father's really nice, religious, spiritual way of expressing his unbelief. See, Jesus doesn't mince words. He tells him exactly what he thinks. He tells him that this is out of faithlessness. But this is where, how the Father responds is where we can begin to learn from him. How the Father responds is a great model for us. See, Jesus confronts his weakness. He confronts his lack of faith, and he doesn't shy away. Jesus calls him out, and he presses in to Jesus. He doesn't run away. He doesn't recoil from intimacy with him. He stays and he asks for more. And unfortunately, I don't think that's how most of us respond when Jesus in the Bible shows us our lack of faith. Often when, when God calls out our lack of faith, we tend to pull away from God to kind of get ourselves right. Like some of us, when you are convicted and you know and you see your lack of faith, you see your sin, your response is kind of to cower and say, yes, sir, you're right. I shouldn't ask for anything. You've had thoughts like, well, who am I to ask for this because I've done these bad things, so I don't deserve to ask for anything. Jesus calls you out, and your response is to be quiet and not to express your needs anymore. Others of us, though, when we get challenged by Jesus, we try to defend ourselves. We begin to press back and say, no, I do have faith. No, I do have faith. And we try to wiggle around what the Bible says or blame our church or blame our community or blame our friends or blame our family. We can't just own it, but still all the while we're pulling away from God. That's what often happens when we see our lack of faith. But this is not how the Father responds. But this is how I respond. This is how I respond. I, so frequently in my life, when I see my lack of faith, I pull away. One of the greatest gifts of my life is to get to, be a, uh, to serve this church as your past, one of your pastors. But the past couple of weeks, I'll be completely frank with you, have been a couple of weeks where I felt completely inadequate. Any responsibility you get in your life given to you from God will make you feel inadequate and weak. Over the past couple of weeks, I've lacked prayer. I've lacked consistency. I've lacked joy. I've lacked faith. You know what I've done is I've run away from God, not towards him. I've pulled away to get myself better before I come back. So I've recognized the lack of faith and I haven't meditated on his word and read the scriptures and stewed over his promises. What I've done is I've meditated on Netflix. I've watched TV show and I'm watching a TV show. It was like six, seven nights ago. I'm watching this show and I'm thinking as I'm watching it, this can do nothing to help with my anxiety and my fears. I can't. I know that. But of course I do one more episode. I haven't run to prayer privately or with my missional community. No, instead, I've done what all of us do. I give myself mental pep talks, you know? All right, now it's going to be different, Tyler. Let's make a new strategy, new battle plan. Now I'm going to be different. 
I have a conversation with someone or I hear a sermon or I sing a song on Sunday and something in me wells up, a, a desire for godliness. And I think, oh, now it's going to change. I don't actually pray, I just think about how I'm going to be different. I, and I give myself ultimatums, thinking that if I just tell myself it'll be different, it will. And it's not. It's not. What I'm doing is I'm trying to get myself right to follow God. I'm seeing my lack of faith and I'm pulling away to get strong to come back to him. The great thing about this father, the great thing about this father in the story is he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He doesn't just say, yes, sir, Jesus, you're right, I'll keep quiet, me and my son will go. He doesn't try to defend himself and say, Jesus, I do have faith. I brought my son to you. I do have faith. No, he doesn't defend himself. No, he does something altogether different. He owns his weakness and he asks for more. He owns his weakness and he asks for more. He tells Jesus, I'm trying to believe. I'm trying to believe you can heal my son. I'm trying to believe you can give me more faith. I need your help. That's why I'm here. You're right about me. But help me. See, when all of us tend to move away, he presses in in prayer. He cries out and is honest about his lack of faith. He doesn't try to hide it. He runs to Jesus, and Jesus responds to this weak prayer. Look at verse 25. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. The most amazing thing happens through this very weak prayer, this very weak faith. Jesus acts. He responds. He undoes what evil had done for years, this little boy. In a moment, he says, you're done, spirit. The disciples had tried. I'm sure doctors had tried. No one could fix this little boy. Jesus speaks and it's done. All because a father cried out in weakness. See, the father knew the weakness was in him, and, but he knew Jesus was the solution. He knew it wasn't going to be fixed by just getting stronger and ha go getting more wisdom. He knew that wouldn't work. He was putting himself completely and utterly depending upon Jesus to help him in everything that he needed. He presses into Jesus when we move away. And here's the great thing about Jesus that we need to wrestle with, is that the weakest faith has access to power in him. That even the weakest faith has access to power through him. See, Jesus demands faith, but not perfection to act on our behalf. You need to hear that statement. Jesus demands faith, but not perfection to act on our behalf. Jesus demands prayer, but he'll respond to even our weakest cries. See, Jesus is the king. He reigns over all. He holds all things together. So it's a treasonous act to act as if someone else could save, to act as if he lacks something. That's why he demands that faith be expressed through prayer because prayer recognizes who he is. Prayer recognizes I don't have power. I'm crying out to you. I don't have strength. I'm crying out to you. I don't have righteousness. I'm crying out to you. Jesus demands he demands prayer because it recognizes who he is. But the, the sweetest thing is that G, even though Jesus demands faith, he doesn't demand perfection to act. He doesn't demand perfection to act on our behalf. This is one of the weakest prayers in the Bible. It's one of the weakest prayers in the Bible. He lacks single-mindedness. He lacks conviction. He knows Jesus could do it, but he still has doubts. He has fears, even as he's praying. This is a very, very weak prayer. But Jesus responds. Jesus listens. Jesus hears him, even though it's a weak attempt. Jesus responds because he's a kind king. He's a kind king. He's merciful. He's slow to anger, abounding in love, and he's generous. See, faith is nothing more than crying out for help. And crying out for help. 
Faith is not powerful because faith in itself is. Faith is strong and powerful when it's placed in Jesus. That's when it's strong. That's when it's powerful. That even if your faith is weak, you have access to great power because of him. See, Jesus, in this moment, he's teaching his disciples, remember? He's giving them a picture of even the weak faith in me has access to great power. See, he's showing them what faith looks like in this life. So I want you to remember, they had just come down from the mountain of transfiguration. They had just seen Jesus glorified. They had just seen what revelation would be like. They saw a snapshot of heaven on earth. And you remember, they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. Peter says, hey, let's build some tents. I'll get some barbecue. We'll be good. They didn't want to leave, and neither would, neither would we. You wouldn't want to leave if you saw the glory of God. You'd want to stay forever. But Jesus took them down the mountain of glory into the valley of brokenness. He took them down from the mountaintop of glory into the valley of brokenness. They had just seen Jesus glorified. They had just seen Moses and Elijah. They had heard the Father speak, and Jesus makes them leave to walk down into a valley where they're greeted with anger and discord, where they're greeted with evil oppression, where they're greeted with faithlessness everywhere. See, he's getting them ready for life after he's gone. He's getting them ready for life in the valley. See, Jesus' disciples then and his disciples today, we follow him and we minister to others not on the mountaintop but down in the valley. We follow him, we minister not on the mountaintop but down in the valley and like the disciples, you and I will come face to face with evil both in the world and in ourselves that we are powerless to overcome. With evil that we don't know how to deal with. And it'll become obvious that we're just like the Father. We don't have full faith in Jesus. But he's showing that faith in the valley looks like us running to Jesus when we're weak, casting everything on him, all of our weaknesses, all of our pains, all of our struggles, all the evils, all of our unbelief, and casting it all at his feet in prayer. That's what he's showing them. That's what faith in the valley looks like. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. It's what Peter commands the church. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We cry out to Jesus not because we're strong, but because he is. Cry out to Jesus not because we are strong, but because he is. We recognize our weaknesses. We recognize, we repent of our lack of faith, but we run to Jesus all the more. We don't pull away, we draw near. And if we're gonna be a faithful church, if we're gonna be a faithful church down in the valley, we have to be a people of prayer. See, too often, too often, we long for the mountaintop experiences to cure the evils of the valley. We long for the mountaintop experiences to cure the evils of the valley, but Jesus has taught his disciples the only thing that deals with evil in the valley is prayer. See, I love, I love our Sunday gatherings at the church. I love them. We need them. We need to be taught authoritatively from the word of God. We need to sing songs to and about God. We need an hour and a half. Each week we're reminded what is most true in this life. We need it, and I love them. But if our spiritual life as a church is just a Sunday to Sunday, I'm looking for mountaintop type experiences, church, if that's what our spiritual life is like, eventually we will be undone by the evils in the valley. Eventually we will be undone by the evils in the valley. See, you can have an amazing mountaintop experience, but all of a sudden you're confronted with your repetitive sin. You're confronted with a sin that you just can't seem to shake. And the mountaintop will not be powerful enough to endure you in that moment. Prayer will be. You're going to confront another miscarriage, another evil. And the mountaintop won't matter 
You have access to power through prayer. You're going to be sharing the gospel and people's hearts become more hardened towards it. You're going to struggle to forgive someone who's wronged you. The enemy is going to hurl accusation after accusation and lie after lie. And in those moments, the nostalgia of a mountaintop will not be powerful enough to save. No, it's in those moments where Jesus says, you have access to all kinds of power, but it comes through prayer. It comes through prayer. And the great thing is that we don't even have to be good at it. We don't even have to be good at praying. See, Jesus gave his life so that his people would know without a shadow of a doubt all the time we have an audience with God the Father. That through Jesus and his cross, we always have an audience with God the Father so we can feel wayward and weak, but we still must cry out to him. We can have unbelief, but we have to ask for help. See, the only way our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers, our family and ourselves, the only way that we can deal with the evils in the valley, both in this world and in ourselves, is through prayer. And this is exactly what Jesus would model for all of his church on the cross. He would model this for us as a church. See, Jesus' greatest triumph over evil for us did not happen on a mountaintop of glory, but it happened in the valley of brokenness. That Jesus was confronted with the greatest evil in the world, all of our sins, all of his people's sins, the greatest evil he would ever face. And the way he overcame it was through suffering on a cross, crying out to his father. It wasn't through a mountaintop experience that he was able to endure and be faithful. It was by crying out to the God who loved him and could save him. He's modeling for us, church, what following him looks like. That following him is in the valley and the mountaintop's coming. The mountaintop's coming, but you have to go through the valley first because God answered his prayer and God raised him up and exalted him over every single thing. See, for us as a people, our prayers don't have to be strong because our king is strong. Our faith can be weak because our Savior is kind, but Jesus has told us that we still must pray, that we still must cry out. Down in the valley, there are great evils that we as a church will come in contact with, but we have power through prayer, and that he hears even our weakest cries. Let's pray. Father, what can we do when we see the evils that we see? God, when we come face to face with the evils in us, with the evils of this world, God, it's overwhelming, it's daunting. And God, the only way that we're going to have access to you is if you give us faith to pray. God, we are a people who constantly go to other things who go to find relief in other places. And Daddy, I want to say I'm sorry. We're sorry. We believe, but help our unbelief. We want to trust more than we do. We want to believe more than we do. But Jesus, we're trusting that even though we have all this unbelief, you can still act that you can still save, that your cross has secured our standing before you. God, don't let us be a church that misses out on prayer. Father, don't let us be a people who walk through this life forgetting that we can talk to our dad whenever we want, that we can be honest with him and candid with him and bold with him because Jesus you have given us a sure hope an anchor for our souls 
And we can know that even in our weakest moment, you hear our cries. God, I ask that you would begin to act. That you would hear the cries of your people even in this moment, even in the songs we're about to sing, and you would act. So that all of us who are down in the valley would begin to realize that we're talking to the one on the mountaintop. That we're talking to the Lord of glory. God, we need you so desperately. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.